Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with James Manicum on Canada and the Asia Pacific. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and uh, Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. And it's my pleasure every week to welcome here into the studios at the Center for International Governance Innovation a noted expert on some aspect of global um, international public policy or global governance. And uh, today I'm happy to welcome back James Manicum, who is uh, CG's uh, research fellow in their global security program and our resident expert on all things Asia Pacific. So well, welcome back. <laughs> uh, lots to talk about, but we'd like to concentrate uh, today on uh, Canada and the Asia Pacific. And uh, many people have followed closely the American so-called pivot toward the Pacific, uh, announced um, actually more than a year ago now yeah. by uh, yeah. President Obama. And uh, most people, I think, are not fully aware that Canada has uh, also, in a sense, attempted to articulate a strategy that represents a kind of Canadian pivot toward the Asia-Pacific region. So maybe we can start just by talking a bit about that. What, what is Canada doing? How is it reorienting itself to the Asia-Pacific? And what's driving this? That's a good question. I think uh, the main difference between our pivot and the American pivot is that our pivot has so far been an economic one. Uh, our effort to uh, improve economic relations with China first and then the rest of the region sort of goes back to about 2009, 2010. Uh, and that has been an effort to reinforce the government's what they call the prosperity agenda. This is about opening Canada to emerging economies, emerging markets and making sure the Canadian uh, business uh, has a chance to compete in those markets uh, in an effort to diversify ourselves away from the U.S. market. Um, in 2009, we stopped being uh, the U.S.'s largest trading partner. And that, that I think, uh, was a pretty serious uh, sign for, uh, for some uh, sections of, of the Canadian government. Uh, and so our pivot is about trying to access those markets uh, as opportunities for Canadian business. Mm. Although the United States is still our largest trading partner they by far. Are. By far, by far. It's a diversification, but not a, not a uh, switch. Yes, not a switch, but a diversification. And you, we've seen a lot of government officials, uh, officials in and outside of government, I'm thinking of Mark Carney specifically, calling on Canadian business to, uh, to be a bit more proactive, a bit more uh, uh, risk acceptant, and, and going into the, to these new markets. And so the Canadian government has embarked on a strategy that is, involves improving relations, talking trade, uh, with these with these countries, mm -hmm. and what that means is turning up, right? We've seen John Baird go to the ASEAN uh, regional meetings uh, with a bit of regularity. Uh, uh, our defense minister attended the Shangri-La dialogue. He was, I think, the first one in a decade to do so, uh, and that's important. The Shangri-La dialogue is an important track 1.5. They call it where there's government in the room. The government gives talks to defense ministers typically. And then there's a host of academic and other sort of NGOs around the fringes, and it's the region's largest conversation about security issues. Mm -hmm. And so having, uh, having Minister McKay there was a, was a big deal. Mm -hmm. Now, how much of this is China-focused? It was initially quite China-focused. Uh, as we're all aware, the Harper government got off on a, what they called a principled foot, I think, with China. And that's partly because I think part of that, part of our government is very, very concerned about Chinese human rights abuses, quite rightly. And that, that part of the government was what was driving policy between 2006 to 2009. Then I think somebody somewhere told the Harper government that perhaps a softer tone on, the, on those issues might be more, a, a more effective way to manage the relationship, just because if you talk about those things, you can't do business with China. I mean, China uh, said that effectively, right? Basically, yeah. basically. And, and to my knowledge, there has been no attempt by any government to, uh, uh, no attempt by any government to, to, to leverage their China based on their economic relationship has successfully changed, China, changed Chinese behavior, as far as I know. So every government eventually learns the lesson that you just can't change Chinese behavior uh, by denying them access to your market. And I think the Harbor government learned that, and we started to move forward from about 2009 when Harbor uh, visited China. Mm -hmm. But the uh, Harbor government seems recently to have been sending a certain amount of mixed signals toward the region. Uh, initially welcoming, encouraging proposals for foreign direct investment in Canada, mm -hmm. in the commodity sectors, the energy sector, yeah. recently approving yes. uh, the Nexon deal and, and so forth, but uh, with some interesting conditions, some interesting strings attached, uh, telegraphing that actually yeah. in the future we're going to be very careful about the, uh, yeah. the conditions under which we approve these kinds of things. Yeah, and I think there are, there are two elements there that are important. One is, is the relationship between the investor and, and its host government. Uh, and that is important because those, those companies, if they have a close relationship with their host government, 
can operate under a different set of incentives uh, than can uh, than can independent uh, or, or, or free market uh, uh, companies. Uh, the other question is a question of reciprocity, right? At the end of the day, it is possible for China to buy Nexa, and cannot, Canada cannot do that to a Chinese company uh, as it currently stands. And so I think the government is approved uh, this one and the Petronas one because they were on the table. Uh, but I think it's going to try to leverage the fact that these countries are interested in bidding for Canadian uh, oil and gas in, in the oil and gas sector as a way to leverage uh, opening up those markets to say Canadian banking or other service industries, which is what a government should do, right? It has to be an equal playing field. And one of the surprises to many was the Harper government's uh, interest in joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership talks, the TPP talks. Yes. Uh, what's your read on the reasons for that, the timing for that, and, and are we actually all that serious? I don't know how serious we are. Short of, of going to war with a few thousand dairy farmers in Quebec, I don't know, and no government has ever, has ever proved willing to do that. Uh, so I'm not sure how serious we are. I think that was about talking trade with anybody who's prepared to talk trade, and the TPP is about that. Uh, likewise, Japan, also very uh, over, outwardly on the part of the NOTA government, very uh, serious about TPP, but I have, again, they have an agricultural lobby, and, and I don't know if that government is strong enough to go to war with that lobby. And we'll see, obviously, in the election coming up in Japan whether or not that's, that, that holds. So I think the TPP move was about, about signaling that we are prepared to talk trade with anybody. Um, and of course, the TPP is really the only regional trade agreement that's open to Canada in the region, right? Everything else is ASEAN-focused, and we just don't have the, 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 the standing in ASEAN to really move forward a, a regional on the region of the ASEAN-centered regional trade agenda. So if the TPP is an APEC-centered regional trade agreement, and so from that point of perspective, that's really the only option for us as a regional group, as a multilateral trade agreement. Does it signal any kind of decline in interest in bilateral free trade agreements? Uh, good question. I, I don't think it does. I think that the government is still prepared to trade with whoever is willing to talk. Uh, and I, you know, the, we're hearing that perhaps we're moving forward with the South Koreans. There's talk about Japan and what on China. So I'm not sure if that's a full signal yet, but I think that the government is prepared to talk to trade with anybody. Very good. We'll be back again in a minute with James Manicum. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. James, you're the author of a new CG report titled A Policy Mismatch, Canada and the United States in the Asia-Pacific Region. Uh, tell us a bit about uh, the theme there and what about that policy mismatch concerns you? The paper just came out of an idea I had that perhaps uh, since Canada and the United States are such close allies everywhere else in the world, are they really as close as we might think or as policymakers in Washington in particular might think? Uh, when it comes to the Asia-Pacific region. And uh, I, I, in the paper, I sort of described the U.S. pivot and I described the Canadian pivot. And I think that by virtue of the fact that our effort is an economic one designed to diversify us away from the U.S. and, and, and make us more integrated into, into regional uh, um, economics in East Asia, I argue that actually, um, at the end of the day, we might not actually be, be great partners for the U.S., um, particularly because the U.S. pivot is a strategic one. It's about reassuring regional allies that the U.S. will be there if there's some kind of regional crisis, things like countries like the Philippines, like Japan, that have maritime boundary and territorial disputes with China. Uh, it's about reaching out to new uh, partners like Vietnam, uh, but, and it's about deterring China. It's about trying to convince the Chinese government that it, cannot, it should not pursue policies that are perceived by the region to be ex expansionist. Containment, really. A form of containment. I wouldn't call it containment, but one could call it containment. Uh, tell us why you wouldn't call it containment. That's from the ch I don't call it containment because from the Chinese perspective, they're not expanding. Uh -huh. um, from the Chinese perspective, they're just taking back things that they have neglected. Uh, and so they're not actually expanding. So if you say to the Chinese work that you're containing them, um, the, the word doesn't really fit. It's also not helpful to call it containment because then they'll treat it like it's containment and then we have a security dilemma. Right. So I'm trying not to contribute to regional instability. But from the American perspective, it really is. It really is. Contained. It's about, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a strong point, sort of a George Kennan type uh, a strategy of, of making close friends with, with important countries in the region. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, uh, because that the U.S. pivot is China-focused, they don't say it is, but it is. Uh, 
that might the, that that fact alone might make Canada not an ideal partner if, in fact, the outcome of our pivot is a closer closer economic relationship with China. Uh, it's not clear to me that the government is prepared or would be prepared to support the U.S. in an overt sense uh, if some kind of issue were to arise. Um, if that meant taking a strong stand against China, particularly because these issues for China, these questions of territory and of maritime jurisdiction, do fall under that rubric of what the Chinese call core interest. They call national sovereignty and territorial integrity a core interest. And so within that, you have these disputes with the Philippines, uh, most of Southeast Asia, and with Japan. And I'm not, and, and the government may decide, at least the Canadian government may decide, that's not a place that Canada uh, necessarily needs to be. Now, would the United States or any other important country in East Asia like to see Canada do a security pivot? Like to see Canada more engaged, more active, maybe even allied or more closely associated with the, an East Asian partner? It would be interesting. I mean, right now we are doing some security work. Uh, we've, we've signed an acquisitions and cross-servicing agreement with Japan, uh, which is basically sort of the, the basic building block of a defense partnership. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we've negotiating uh, access with Singapore. Those two things will largely lead to a, 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 make it easier for Canada to support the, the region in humanitarian assistance, disaster relief stuff, uh, which we did after, after, cyclone, after um, the Asian tsunami in 2004, and we offered help to Burma in 2008, which they declined. Uh, uh, so we're already doing that a little bit. I think an overt Canadian alliance with some of these countries uh, would, would, be, would, would be welcomed by some of these countries. I think they would like to see you know, one more country on their side. And that's how some of these debates are going in, in some of these countries, in the, particularly in, in the Philippines and some parts of Japan. Mm. It's very much becoming an us and them thing with them being China. So who would welcome it most? I think, I think the Japanese uh, and the Philippines would very much appreciate uh, an overt statement uh, mm. in support of, of certain aspects of the region, in particular the, the issue of, of, of freedom of navigation, right. um, which we have been conspicuously silent on. Right. But we could contribute to. We do now have assets that are capable of interoperating with, uh, oh, certainly yes. with the U.S. Navy. I mean, nobody yes. does that better than the Canadian absolutely. Navy. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, whether we can afford to put them in the region is another question, right? Um, right? Where defense cuts are coming, all those cuts everywhere else in every, every sector of public spending. So whether or not we have the, the, cap we have the capability, or whether we have the, 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 the budget to send those ships, keep them over there, uh, that's another question. Mm -hmm. We are doing some of that. We sent our largest contingent to RIMPAC, the Rim of the Pacific exercise, which right. is the, the largest U.S.-led naval exercise in the region uh, this past summer. Uh, and for the first time, the Canadian officers had some fairly important positions in that exercise. And that's a signal. Uh, but again, I don't think the government is, is going to pursue a very formal defense relationship with the region. And you could argue that perhaps it shouldn't. Right. I mean, it, choosing sides in, this, in these disputes uh, could have consequences, economic consequences, if in fact our objective is to improve economic relations with China. Mm -hmm. And so perhaps the government may calculate that it's best just to stay out of it and just talk economics. Right. Now, in your report, you make a very strong case that there is a policy mismatch and, and you yeah. raise warning flags. Uh, yeah. My sense is that it may not be apparent to policymakers in Ottawa that this may be news to them, that you may have sort of brought something new to their attention. That would be a little surprising. Um, it might be less surprising that it would be news to the Americans because we often sneak under their radar anyway, and so they might not necessarily yeah. pay much attention to a, a policy mismatch in the region with Canada. Yeah, we, we do fall under their radar, although I've, I've had conversations with colleagues in Washington, and, and, and uh, American colleagues, government colleagues who work on Canada uh, are interested in what we're doing in the region uh, and, 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 and just how closely we can work together. I think what you ultimately get is a very quiet effort. We're not going to talk about what we're, what we're doing, but anything we will do will be, of course, under the U.S. umbrella. And, and I think that if we explain it to the U.S. that way, I think they'll be fine with it. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, they know the region is not, the military, the strategic stability of the region is not vital enough for us to make an overt uh, a statement of, of, you know, here we are. Is there anything concrete that Canada can do to make sure this doesn't become an issue? Uh, with the U.S.? Other than or? just more close coordination of the kind you talked about? Yeah, I think there's an opportunity for Canada to contribute to regional stability in a, in a way that, that, uh, that it, it is not perceived to be a U.S. client state. Mm -hmm. uh, and that might be a way to sort, of, uh, to sort of move those issues forward. It's always been a challenge uh, 
think folks in the region do, do think of Canada as a U.S. client. They state. certainly do, and in particular, China does. Right. Very good. We'll be back again in a minute with James Manicum. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So, uh, Asia Pacific security issues uh, have been in the headlines a lot mm. recently. Yeah. And you've been in the region, and I've been in the region, and that's pretty much all anybody talks about just at the moment. Yeah. How serious is what's going on now, and uh, what in particular do you personally tend to worry about most in terms of Asia Pacific security right now? It's pretty serious. Uh, it used to, and the, the, the way you know it's serious is that the region used to not talk about these issues. These issues used to be dealt with quietly, issues of, of, of maritime boundary and, 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 and sovereign jurisdiction disputes over, right. over little islands and the waters that are around them, fisheries, oil and gas, all the things that come out of that. Those used to be dealt with fairly, fairly quietly. And it used to be taboo for a country to point the finger at another one and say, you are, what, you are misbehaving. Uh, and, and, and countries now do that with a degree of regularity. At every single regional meeting, as the ASEAN focused ASEAN plus three, East Asia Summit, these issues are on the agenda. And countries are pointing fingers and saying, hang on a minute, we don't agree. Uh, it happened uh, in 2010, it happened uh, in, in 2011, and it happened again this past summer when Cambodia, who was the chair of, of ASEAN, was, was criticized by its fellow ASEAN countries, publicly criticized, which is again new for ASEAN. Uh, for basically uh, catering to the Chinese desires to keep these issues off the agenda and out of the final statement. And of course, this summer, for the first time, they were unable to issue uh, a statement out of the ASEAN meeting, which was, which was a, a, a precedent, uh, et cetera. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a problem. I think in terms of what I worry about, these are ultimately, at the end of the day, rocks and islands. Uh, these are not issues of, of, of existential security. And no country is going to invade another or attack another's capital over these issues. But the problem is because each country claims these little rocks and claims these to exercise jurisdiction in these waters, uh, uh, actions by other claimants are perceived to be the next best thing to an invasion. Uh, and that's a problem. In particular, because the entire region has become more maritime oriented. The region, East Asia, is a very maritime region. There's water everywhere. And a significant portion of each country's economy is linked with that with the ocean. Uh, at this, and because of that, at a time when all these countries have gotten uh, uh, more wealthy, you've seen an investment in, in enforcement capabilities, naval capabilities, and all those ships are now in contested waters, driving around, doing what they believe their jobs are. Uh, and that's where I get worried, is, is, is who's in control of these, or, these, these, these coast guards, if you want to call them that. Uh, what do they understand the rules of engagement to be with their, with their, uh, with their counterparts from other countries? Uh, and, and, and whether, uh, who is in, what's the command and control like? Who do they talk to? Uh, and what is that person's understanding of just how far they're prepared to go when they assert jurisdiction in contested waters? And is there a particular dispute at the moment that you're worried about most? I'm equally worried about the South China Sea and the East China Sea, uh, frankly. I'm not worried about uh, the Tukdo Takashima dispute between Japan and South Korea. Uh, I, it's not something that weighs heavily in my mind. I'm not concerned about the Northern Territories, uh, Southern Corrales dispute between Japan and Russia. The South China Sea is getting, is getting uh, uh, pretty interesting. Uh, the, the Philippines, in, to, in, in the spring of this past year, the Philippines and China were in a standoff at Scarborough Shoal. And, and that, was the, the, that, that, that went as long as it did. Um, and that the Philippines sent out their, their finest naval ship uh, to stand up to the Chinese was interesting. Uh, because there are some who believe the Philippines may have been emboldened uh, by the United States to actually go and do that. And of course, I think the U.S. probably would have preferred they not do that, uh, because the United States does not want to fight China for the Philippines, right. although it may be required to. Uh, so that, that was pretty serious. And the East China Sea is also um, quite serious, with the, uh, the, the Japanese government nationalized the Senkaku Jayu Islands, really to get ahead of a nationalist called Shintaro Ishihara, who, is the, who used to be the mayor of Tokyo. He's now running for office. Uh, f uh, 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 federal government office um, uh, to get ahead of that of that extreme nationalist, his attempt to buy the islands, the Japanese government nationalized them. They assumed the Chinese would would understand that they were trying to avoid a worst case scenario. The Chinese government either didn't or has taken the advantage to take advantage of the fact that they 
they thought they would do that and has basically created a crisis. Uh, and that became pretty serious as well. Um, and that actually started to uh, affect the economic interdependence between China and Japan. And it hurt both equally. Chinese citizens boycotted Japanese products, which in turn led to job losses in China because that's where those products are made. Right. Um, and that's what's really concerning. Uh, in international relations, we think economic interdependence reinforces cooperation. And here you've got a government that is prepared to hurt its own economy to make a point over these islands. Mm -hmm. That's quite concerning. Mm -hmm. Now, I've, I've often wondered why it is that the, many of the claimants in the South China Sea, many countries have overlapping, mm -hmm. sometimes not overlapping, but many yeah. different countries have claims to islands in the South China Sea. Why don't the smaller, weaker ones get together and settle their claims and then confront China with a united front when it comes to yeah. territorial disputes? That's a good question. Uh, I think for a long time there was a bit of distrust between those claimants. Uh, although we've heard recently out of the East Asian Summit that is in fact what they are going to do. Uh, out of the last East, East, East Asian Summit in November, it turns out that that is exactly what the ASEAN claimants are going to do. Vietnam. Uh, Brunei, Malaysia, and the Philippines are going to get together and have a talk about their claims and try to reconcile them and then present that to China. Uh, how effective that will be is interesting because the Chinese government could still refuse to negotiate with the four of them and still insist on negotiating bil uh, bilaterally, uh, at which point you, know, you could make an argument that each claimant would still be weaker because it has now, it's now bound to these other three states to, 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 uh, to abide by whatever agreement they decided on. But I think that's an important step, and it's certainly an encouraging one that, in fact, uh, you know, there's now incentive for these countries to cooperate. Any cooperation is good cooperation. I think it also tells us something of just how China is perceived in the region. For a long time, uh, China was seen to be the regional good guy. Mm -hmm. Between 2001 and, and 2008, China was, was welcomed in the region. The fact that countries are now getting together uh, uh, to try to get ahead of China is is interesting. Mm -hmm. It tells us something how China is perceived. What role, if any, do you think the International Court of Justice might have here? Well, uh, for the, the International Court of Justice to have a role, everyone would have to agree right. that they could have jurisdiction. Uh, I don't think the Chinese government's keen on that. Um, uh, weaker countries typically are the ones that favor International Court of, of Justice uh, involvement. Uh, it's not unprecedented. Right, Malaysia uh, has been at the court twice, once with Singapore and once with Indonesia. Uh, and so that's obviously important. What's interesting, though, is that in the case of Malaysia, Indonesia, settling um, the Sibidan Ligitan Islands dispute didn't prevent tensions from erupting in the waters that surround the islands mm -hmm. because they only did address sovereignty; they didn't address delimitation. So I don't, th I, don't I don't think it's right to look at the International Court of Justice as a silver bullet here, uh, even if everyone would agree mm -hmm. uh, to go to the court. Very good. We'll be back one last time with James Manicum. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So James, I understand you're also working on another project now, uh, which is a policy paper yep. essentially designed to explore how we might re-engage, Canada might re-engage in Asia-Pacific security and, in effect, round out the pivot. Yeah. Uh, tell us a bit about that project and what you have in mind. Yeah. Well, I start with the idea that most of the debates in Canada about the region, East Asia, have been focused on the economic relationship. And this is a, a striking disconnect from uh, our friends in the region, not our allies, because we don't have allies in the region, but our friends like Australia, Japan, and South Korea, they are quite preoccupied with both the economic and the strategic dimension, particularly the rise of China. And so what I'm trying to do is begin that debate in Canada and try to get us to talk and think about uh, what role, if any, uh, the security dimension should play in our re-engagement and what effect can we have on some of the security issues in the region. Uh, and I, I guess I, I sort of make the case for what I call um, a maritime diplomacy, adding a maritime diplomacy element uh, to our re-engagement. And that would involve doing the kinds of things we've done before, confidence building, but a bit more proactively uh, than we did before. Canada's legacy in the region is, of course, the, the South China Sea Dialogues, which were funded by the Canadian International Development Agency, hosted by Indonesia. And they were very important. They were the only dialogue at which all the claimants to the South China Sea were present, including Taiwan, uh, which is, of course, tough to get into uh, uh, dialogues because of the, its relationship with China. 
But it was important. And when you go to the region and you go to Southeast Asia, every, and they, people find out you're Canadian, they, they mention that. It's like Norman Bethune in China. It's the South China Sea dialogues in, in Southeast Asia. They remember that. Uh, and so there is a demand for us to perhaps do that kind of thing again. I would argue that's probably not the best way forward just because the region is, for one thing, saturated with Track 2 dialogues. There's a Track 2 on the South China Sea every other week. Secondly, China doesn't want to participate in those anymore because what's happened is every time there's a Track 2, people turn up and everyone yells at China. And that's fine, perhaps it's deserved, but that's not, uh, that's not the way to bring Chinese engagement. So what I argue for is, is a, a couple of different avenues to sort of try to build confidence in the region, but functional confidence. Uh, one thing might be to partner with the Australians and, and engage the Chinese Navy. Uh, as you pointed out, Canada is the most interoperable Navy uh, uh, with the U.S. Navy in the world. Uh, the U.S. formal U.S.-China actual exercises are banned by U.S. law. And there's talk in the U.S. of inviting China to RIMPAC 2014. What better way to set the stage for that than to have two close navies with the U.S., U uh, Canada, and Australia start to exercise with the Chinese Navy. I think there's appetite for that in China. They are trying to increase uh, uh, the frequency of their international naval engagement. Um, and so if we could dig up the money to actually get a few ships to the region, that might be something we could do. But if you're actually worried about an increase in Chinese naval capability, why would you want to stimulate that by exercising with them? Well, exercises are about building transparency. So they can see what we can do and we can see what they can do. Uh, and I think that's important. I mean, to the extent to which the Chinese Navy is going to grow. Right, but they're also about building regardless. intelligence. Gathering they are, intelligence. they are. And there are, and, and, but you know, the, the Australians have already done this once. I and mean, there are ways to, ways to, to manage that, right? Mm -hmm. In particular, the Chinese, you don't get great access uh, when you, you know, have a naval exchange with the Chinese, at least what the Americans tell me, right? Uh, you know, the Americans will show them a great deal of, of, of very interesting things, and the Chinese will show them the same hospital ship they showed them last year. Uh, and that's the way it is. Uh, this is about making what is a very, what appears to be a very honest effort to try to build transparency and to build interoperability. Right now, we do actually talk to the Chinese, but that's in the Gulf of Aden, where, of course, they and us are, are participating in, in security operations there. Another way forward might be Coast Guards. Let's say the Navy is too, too classified, too sensitive. What about Coast Guard cooperation? Uh, like Canada, most East Asian states have to police a very large exclusive economic zone with very few ships. Um, our Coast Guard is very good. Uh, we have good Coast Guard relations with a lot of Northeast Asian countries because we're, we're in a, the North Pacific Coast Guard Forum with the U.S., China, South Korea, Russia, and Japan. Uh, why not try to improve cooperation with, with the Chinese that way? We could even improve cooperation between the Chinese, Japanese, and South Koreans. And those are three Coast Guards that do not get along. Mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese and South Koreans in particular have had a number of incidents. Uh, and so there's an opportunity there for Canada to sort of try to, to try to uh, build relationships between those countries that wouldn't that otherwise wouldn't uh, be, in our, be 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 acting together. Is there a way of doing this without encouraging the view in the region that Canada is in fact a surrogate for the United States? Uh, no, but we'll just have to go ahead and try to do that anyway. Um, there's very little we can do to affect how we are perceived, uh, rightly or wrongly, because of course we would be doing this on our own volition, we're a sovereign country. And I think Although in the South China Sea dialogue, apparently, we weren't perceived as... We were not perceived uh, as, exactly. Uh, and, 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 you know, we can't, we can't really affect how other countries mm -hmm. perceive us. Um, I think, though, that an active effort by Canada to engage in those issues uh, would certainly be welcomed by everybody in the region and, and would, in time, by interacting with us, they would understand that we are our own country, that we do things our own way, and that we are not a U.S. client state. Mm -hmm. And what about the uh, vaunted Chinese naval build up an expansion that does worry so many countries in the region. Uh, does this worry you? Is this a, a serious military threat to others, and, or is it being fundamentally misunderstood? Well, um, that's a good question, and I kind of come down in the middle. It's quite natural for a country like China, uh, with, the, with the nature of its maritime interests, uh, to build a strong navy. Um, and most of its capabilities are actually focused on regional contingencies. Now, that's still not good for Taiwan and Japan and the Philippines, but there's very little in the Chinese Navy that can threaten the Canadian Navy just by virtue of distance. Um, although, you know, some of, and, but some of the things are prestige. You know, the aircraft carrier is a prestige program. You don't need an aircraft carrier to do what China needs to do to defend itself right. or even to assert itself in the South China Sea. It doesn't need an aircraft carrier to do that. Uh, but the aircraft carrier is about, you know, the idea that China is becoming a great power. Um, but aircraft carrier programs, the development of those are expensive uh, and, uh, and they are, are dangerous. Um, 
but you know, who knows? Uh, if, if we engage China properly, we might welcome the fact one day they have an aircraft carrier and the ability to project power if it's humanitarian intervention of some kind overseas. That is a 75-year project. Right. That's off long in the future. But I'm not too concerned about the Chinese naval development, but again, I'm not in the region. Right. Regional states are very concerned. Right. Well, thanks again for coming in and uh, helping us understand these very complicated issues much better. And I hope the uh, policy audiences actually pay good attention both to the uh, existing policy paper and to the forthcoming. Thanks. Uh, because there are some uh, dangers there for sure. And to our audience, thank you for joining us today. Uh, we will be taking a little bit of a break, uh, but we will be back in the new year with the second half of the third season of Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. And when we are back, please look for us again at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Some interesting conditions, some interesting strings attached, uh, telegraphing that actually yeah. in the future we're going to be very careful about the, uh, yeah. the conditions under which we approve these kinds of things. Yeah, and I think there are, there are two elements there that are important. One is, is the relationship between the investor and, and its host government. Uh, and that is important because those, those companies, if they have a close relationship with their host government, can operate under a different set of incentives uh, than can uh, than can independent uh, or, or, or free market uh, uh, companies. Uh, the other question is a question of reciprocity, right? At the end of the day, it is possible for China to buy Nexa and Canada, Canada cannot do that to a Chinese company uh, as it currently stands. And so I think the government is approved uh, this one and the Petronas one because they were on the table. Uh, but I think it's going to try to leverage the fact that these countries are interested in bidding for Canadian uh, oil and gas in, in the oil and gas sector as a way to leverage uh, opening up those markets to say Canadian banking or other service industries, which is what a government should do, right? It has to be an equal playing field. And one of the surprises to many was the Harper government's uh, interest in joining the Trans-Pacific Partnership Talks, the TPP talks. Uh, sections of, of the Canadian government. Uh, and so our pivot is about trying to access those markets uh, as opportunities for Canadian business. Mm -hmm. Although the United States is still our largest trading partner they by certainly far. Are. By far, by far. It's a diversification, but not a, not a uh, switch. Yes, not a switch, but a diversification. And we've seen a lot of government officials, uh, officials in and outside of government, I'm thinking of Mark Carney specifically, calling on Canadian business to, uh, to be a bit more proactive, a bit more uh, risk acceptant, and, and going into the, to these new markets. And so the Canadian government has embarked on a strategy that is, involves improving relations, talking trade, uh, with these with these countries, mm -hmm. and what that means is turning up, right? We've seen John Baird go to the ASEAN uh, regional meetings uh, with a bit of regularity. Uh, uh, our defense minister attended the Shangri-La dialogue. He was, I think, the first one in a decade to do so, uh, and that's important. The Shangri-La dialogue is an important track 1.5. They call it where there's government in the room. The government gives talks to defense ministers typically. And then there's a host of academic and other sort of NGOs around the fringes, and it's the region's largest conversation about security issues. Mm -hmm. And so having, uh, having Minister McKay there was a, was a big deal. Mm -hmm. now how much of this is China-focused? It was initially quite China-focused, uh, as we're all aware. Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with James Manicum on Canada and the Asia Pacific. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and uh, Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. And it's my pleasure every week to welcome here into the studios at the Center for International Governance Innovation a uh, noted expert on some aspect of global uh, international public policy or global governance. And uh, today I'm happy to welcome back James Maticum, who is uh, CG's uh, research fellow in their global security program and our resident expert on all things Asia Pacific. So well, welcome back. <laughs> uh, lots to talk about, but we'd like to concentrate uh, today on uh, Canada and the Asia Pacific and uh, many people. Where the Harper government got off on a, what they called a principled foot, I think, with China. And that's partly because I think part of that 
part of our government is very, very concerned about Chinese human rights abuses, quite rightly. And that, that part of the government was what driving policy between 2006 to 2009. Then I think somebody somewhere told the Harper government that perhaps a softer tone on, the, on those issues might be more, a, a more effective way to manage the relationship, just because if you talk about those things, you can't do business with China. I mean, China uh, said that effectively, right? Basically, yeah. basically. And, and to my knowledge, there has been no attempt by any government to, uh, uh, no attempt by any government to, to, to leverage their China based on their economic relationship has successfully changed, China, changed Chinese behavior, as far as I know. So every government eventually learns the lesson that you just can't change Chinese behavior uh, by denying them access to your market. And I think the Harbor government learned that, and we started to move forward from about 2009 when Harbor uh, visited China. Mm -hmm. But the uh, Harbor government seems recently to have been sending a certain amount of mixed signals toward the region, uh, initially welcoming, encouraging proposals for foreign direct investment in Canada, mm -hmm. in the commodity sectors, the energy sector, yeah. recently approving yes. uh, the Nexon deal and, and so forth. But uh, with sort of followed closely the American so-called pivot toward the Pacific, uh, announced um, actually more than a year ago now yeah. by uh, yeah. President Obama. And uh, most people, I think, are not fully aware that Canada has uh, also, in a sense, attempted to articulate a strategy that represents a kind of Canadian pivot toward the Asia-Pacific region. So maybe we can start just by talking a bit about that. What, what is Canada doing? How is it reorienting itself to the Asia-Pacific? And what's driving this? That's a good question. I think uh, the main difference between our pivot and the American pivot is that our pivot has so far been an economic one. Uh, our effort to uh, improve economic relations with China first and then the rest of the region sort of goes back to about 2009, 2010. Uh, and that has been an effort to reinforce the government's what they call the prosperity agenda. This is about opening Canada to emerging economies, emerging markets and making sure the Canadian uh, business uh, has a chance to compete in those markets uh, in an effort to diversify ourselves away from the U.S. market. Um, in 2009, we stopped being uh, the U.S.'s largest trading partner. And that, that I think, uh, was a pretty serious uh, sign for, uh, for some uh, 